gathered the waters of the sea as in a bottle. He put the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord, for all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. be with you. Peace is not the absence of conflict, but it's wholeness experienced in the context of relationship between one another, with God, with all of creation. This is why we show a sign of peace to one another by way of handshake or hug, because it's not the distance between us that experiences a peace, but when we're connected with one another and with God. So at this time, I invite you to pass the peace of Christ with those around you by way of handshake, a hug, whatever seems important in the context of those who are around you. Let's pass the peace of Christ. And children at this time will be dismissed down to their classes as well. Let's pass the peace of Christ.
Okay, let's just get the coffee and go downstairs. <laughs> A lot of connecting going on out there. I like it. I like it a lot. As you've noticed, we've had this insert in our Lenten journey so that you can doodle or make notes or eventually as we have a time of reflection after the sermon to write your own note of things about what God is longing for for us and what our prayer is in response to God. We're going to be in the minor prophet Micah. You are invited to turn there if you'd like to, in the back of the Old Testament, very end of the Old Testament. Micah's name means, who is like Yahweh? Interesting name. What's your name? Who is like Yahweh? And if you are reading the Old Testament and you notice that the spelling of Lord is all in capitals, that translation is Yahweh the holiest version of God's name. God is faithful covenant keeper. And Micah's writing in the 8th century uh, before Christ. He's writing to people who are committed to following God's ways and not the ways of the people around them. But it didn't take long for them to want to be like the people around them and the nations around them, to have kings like theirs and wealth and military might. Empire building is in us. Perhaps that's why when we were in Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel talked about the ancient ziggurats. You see a picture of it there. There was this tendency to want to build up. And yet God scatters and sends them out. No, you are to fill the earth. And you are to be a blessing to all the families in the earth. That is God's intent. So empires soon will rise around them after the time of Micah. Eventually, they'll be conquered by the empire of Assyria, conquered by the empire of Babylon. So wars and rumors of wars. When will it ever end? Turn with me to Micah chapter 4. Let's pray before we hear these first five verses of Scripture. God, by your Holy Spirit, help us to hear the words of this prophet, and in this hearing, to hear you. In Jesus' name, amen. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be raised up above the hills. Peoples shall stream to it, and many nations shall shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples, and shall arbitrate between strong nations far away. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But they shall all sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all the peoples walk, each in the name of its God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God, forever and ever. Amen. Gift of God's word. Thanks be to God. No more war. Can you imagine that? I know. You're shaking your heads. No more war. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. I ain't get a steady war anymore. We've sung it. We've hoped for it. But can you imagine in Afghanistan, in Yemen, in Sudan, the Republic of Congo, anywhere in the world, no war? Lisa Sharon Harper writing her book, and went on, she went on a pilgrimage to the Balkan Peninsula, and they studied this passage in Micah. 
And she said as they were studying it, one of the members of their group thought for a long, long time and finally had said, how would we learn history if we never learned war anymore? True, even in the Bible, 14 chapters in, first time kings are mentioned, in the same sentence, wars are mentioned. And there's been, ever since, this ongoing series sequence of wars. No more war and no more fear. No one shall make them afraid, Micah promises. All shall sit under their own vine and their own fig tree. Doesn't that sound unrealistic? I mean, really. And yet, it's what is promised, not only in this prophet, this minor prophet, Micah, the exact same words are found in Isaiah chapter 2. It's what is promised at this table. It's what is promised in the coming kingdom in Jesus Christ. And learning his ways, walking in his paths. And later in this worship service, we will touch it and we will taste it. These tiny, tiny bits of bread, tiny taste of juice. No more war. No more fear. Really? Friday before last, I was so glad to find out that Shane Claiborne and the co-author of this book, Michael Martin, were actually going to be in this area doing what they have called their Beating Guns tour, visiting 37 cities in this country and inviting people in these communities to donate their guns if they want to, and then right there, they have a traveling forge and a traveling anvil, converting those guns into um, gardening tools, from instruments of destruction to instruments of life. Now, Shane Claiborne, the reason I was really thrilled about this is uh, this man is pretty well known across the nation, probably around the world, as a radical follower of Jesus Christ. He grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. He went to a lot of the universities we would know about in terms of the journey of an evangelical. But he is one of those uh, followers of Jesus who he's written books like uh, Jesus for President and an article, What If Jesus Meant All This Stuff? He's co-host of a program called The Red Letter Christians basically taking seriously with Tony Campolo the words that Jesus spoke. And he's not only said it, he has lived it. He lives in an intentional community in downtown Philadelphia with the poor called The Simple Way. And Shane spent time in Calcutta with Mother Teresa for 10 weeks and really learned in that experience that he wanted to live his ethic, he wanted to live his values. He also spent time in Baghdad during the war uh, with a Christian peacemakers team and saw uh, up close the effects of war. So now he's a part of this traveling enactment of this promise that we just read in Micah. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. So taking, uh, each, each person had the chance to be a part of this transformation of a instrument of death into an instrument of life. It was hosted at the Episcopal Church in Belmont. And uh, we went out front after they gave their presentation and talked about uh, everything that's in this book. And the thing that was unfortunately most striking for me was how few people were there. There probably weren't even 20 people there. Was that a statement? about how impossible this seems to us to reverse this trend toward more fear and more weapons to more violence. It just seemed like this small crowd um, just reinforced how unlikely this vision is. But I've got to say, like this very, very small sacrament on our communion table, behind all of the liturgical art. I was so grateful for their prophetic witness to God's kingdom come in Jesus Christ. There they were, these men, speaking against toxic masculinity. Christians, followers of Jesus, 
speaking in hope of this promise coming true, where nobody will learn war anymore, even though it seems like a losing battle. And it is a battle. There is this battle going on in us, this inclination to want to go in the direction of building empire, and this inclination of God that wants to move us away from building empire to blessing all the families of the earth. Last week, I had the chance to hear John Meacham speak. He's written several books, uh, mostly biographies about presidents, living and dead. In his most recent book, The Soul of America, The Battle for Our Better Angels, was the content of much of what he said, but in the in the process of speaking, he was talking about this innate tendency in us throughout our history toward nativism and populism and racism. And he was speaking positively about the corrective of democracy and how it was created to be a corrective to these innate tendencies in us. He didn't call it empire and building empire, but it was all those things that contribute to being empire builders. And even the best in us, even when we are confident of the best in us, there is this innate tendency, this inclination toward empire building. Years ago, when my nephew became a Green Beret, I was very interested in what the Green Berets do, and I read a really, really fascinating article, helpful article, talking about the work of the Green Berets in, all around the world. And uh, from what my nephew said, they're in 90 countries. And the intent, the desire, is to go into countries that are unstable and to go into the places of vulnerability and to work for stability and to work for uh, American interests there. And as I read the article, and it was, it was encouraging to hear that, and then on the other hand, just being aware that sometimes what is in the best interest of our country may not be in the best interest of that country. And sometimes can undo ways of being whole economies in the interests of our country. Even on Friday when we were talking about how helpful uh, the Peace Corps is as a relationship building one-on-one -on -one or, or really getting to know other worlds and other cultures and appreciating them, someone who'd been in the Peace Corps talked about traumatic experiences of trying to transport in medical practices that really were in conflict and not sustainable with the local culture. There is this war in the best of us even, this inclination toward building up our way of being, our wealth, our influence, our power, our might, and losing the mandate of God, the shalom of God, to move out and to be a blessing to all the families of the earth where all will be blessed. And we see it in the beginning of human history, as we've already said, with the picture of the ziggurats. It's interesting you think about Abraham's beginnings. When Abraham was sent out, he was sent out from his homeland where there was great security and stability for him and probably wealth. And he was sent out of that in order to start a people that would be blessing all the families of the earth. And as the people grew and grew over the years, they looked around and they felt pressed in by all the nations around them and intimidated and threatened. And they cried out to God and said, we want a king. And they were warned, well, if you get a king, you're going to get oppression, and you're going to get slavery, and you're going to get this and this and this. And they said, we don't care. We want a king. God gives them a king. So there was this desire to be like everybody else, to have a strong military, to build up wealth and power and empire for themselves, while God's governance and desire and mandate and original shalom was to move us out to be a blessing to all the earth. And you think about the, the biggest defining moment in Israel's history. When Moses was called to help lead the people out of slavery in Egypt, the most intense picture of empire we have in Scripture. And what did Israel learn after they were delivered from Egypt? And they were out there in the wilderness for 40 years. They learned God's governance. They learned God's ways. The Ten Commandments were given to them. The Torah was given to them. The law was given to them. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. And right in the middle of that is 
the mandate to practice the Sabbath, the greatest equalizing practice of all. Every seven days, you will stop. Stop your productivity and everyone will rest. You will rest and all your servants will rest and the immigrants will rest and even the livestock will rest. All the blessings were equalized, not just the people who could control things, but everybody. And you may not know about this, but every seven years, a part of what God built into God's governance was that every seven years there was a sabbatical year. And in that sabbatical year, all of Israel was commanded to rest for that year and their fields and all the debts were canceled, and all the slaves were set free every seven years. Lisa Sharon Harper writes about, can you imagine the impact this would have on an economy? The sabbatical year would greatly hamper Israel's ability to build an economy that would fuel a dominating empire. If all debts were forgiven every seven years and free labor was set free, the economy would be forced to recalibrate. Here we see God placing boundaries on the world's capacity to build empire, similar to what God did at the Tower of Babel. Well, not only that, was there a sabbatical year every seven years, seven times that, 49 plus, there was a year of jubilee every 50 years. Not only does everyone rest, regardless of their stature in the hierarchy there, and not only are all debts forgiven, and slaves set free, but all land goes back to the original family that God gave to them. Think about that. It was a reset button. And it prevented the buildup of wealth and power that would work against God's purposes to protect the flourishing of all, especially the vulnerable ones. Leviticus 25.10. It's on our liberty bell. You shall hallow the 50th year and you shall proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. As far as we know, we've never practiced this. Not just here. Hebrew people never practice it. Jubilee has never happened. And that's not surprising, is it? It's kind of hard to imagine how that would really function. But I remember over 10 years ago doing a series on Sabbath in this church because it's such an important piece of what's in Scripture. And I remember you telling me it's not possible to truly rest for 24 hours every seven days. Nice idea, not possible. <laughs> and then hundreds of years later, Jesus showed up in his hometown of Nazareth in the synagogue, was handed the scroll, opened it up to Isaiah 61. He read, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's the year of Jubilee. And it's as if Jesus was saying, you may not be able to do this, but I'm here, I'm bringing it now. I am bringing God's governance right now, right here. The people kept wanting Jesus to fit into the empire building, right? That's the kind of Messiah they wanted him to be. And I love this verse in John 6, 15. When Jesus realized they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. He wasn't going to have anything to do with it. God is not up to our empire ways. God came to defeat them and to free us to be what we were originally created to be, to move out so that all experience God's blessing. Lisa Sharon Harper writes, Jesus allowed the dominion of human empire to take its best shot, and he was killed. And then he rose again, and God won. God beat the power of human empire, not with a sword, but with the power of the resurrection. This battle for our souls has been won. In Jesus' death and resurrection. 
In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains, shall be raised up above the hills, peoples shall stream to it, and many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to that mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, he shall judge between many peoples and shall arbitrate between strong nations far away, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more, but they shall all sit under their own vines and under their own fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid." For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. In the book, Beating Guns, they write this. Both Micah and Isaiah tell of this holy movement where God's people turn from death to life and transform their weapons into garden tools. And the prophets go on to say that in the end... Nation shall not rise up against nation. The world will no longer learn to make war. We are offered a vision of a world free from violence and bombs and guns and drones and all the ugly stuff of death. And according to the prophets, though, peace does not begin with kings or presidents or heads of state. They're the ones who keep creating the wars. Peace begins with the people. It's not politicians who lead the way to peace. It is the people of God who lead the politicians to peace. Peace begins with the people of God who refuse to kill and who insist on beating their weapons into farm tools. The prophecy ends with the vision of a world free of violence, but it begins with us. That night, we each, when we were at the beating guns experience gathering, There's a thing called flash paper where you can light it on fire and it goes, it just disappears really fast in a flash. So we were invited to write on there what was keeping us from moving in the direction of peace. What were we harboring inside us, clinging to? And in this instance, in our reflection time, what is it that we're hanging on to by way of hanging on to our own wealth, our own power, what is blessing us at the expense of all the families of the earth being blessed. So in this time of reflection, musical reflection, take this out and write. Just write whatever comes to you.
may be seated. I have a few short announcements for us before we receive this morning's offering. The first is that we have a special offering today and next week. Today we're receiving a special offering for Second Harvest Food Bank. So if you'd like to contribute to that special offering, take one of our envelopes and please designate that that's where your offering is going to. And then next week we're receiving a Presbyterian-wide uh, special offering for one great hour of sharing. And you can see there's special envelopes in each of the pews in front of you. And as the entire church contributes to this offering, it goes to the efforts of disaster assistance and development around the entire world. So much like what Pastor Mary was talking about today, it's the Presbyterian Church's effort to come alongside those who are in need throughout the entire world. So take a look at those envelopes. And then next week is Palm Sunday worship service, and we're also combining it with the Mexico sharing service. And the following Sunday is Easter, and we have two Easter worship services, one at 930 and one at 11. So, of course, you are all welcome and invited to come to those worship services. And now will the ushers please come forward for this morning's offering. As we come to this table, we always like to make it really clear that everybody is invited to receive the bread and the blood of Jesus Christ, to receive this victory over these empire inclinations in us. It doesn't matter if you're Presbyterian or not a Presbyterian, if you're a person of great faith or little faith, a wonderful life or a life you regret, you are invited to come. And at the same time, I feel like I need to give a warning that as you come, 
you really are coming to give yourself completely to the governance of God in Jesus Christ, which is going to move you away from hanging on to what is yours, to let it go, so that the whole world, all the families of the earth, can sit under their own vine, under their own fig tree, and experience the fullness of God's blessing. But you're invited to come. Loving God, who is like Yahweh? Who is like Yahweh? That seems like an impossibility, God, that anyone on this earth can be like Yahweh. Yet perhaps we can be like Yahweh in small ways. Maybe it's the small things, God. Maybe it's like taking a small piece of bread and dipping it into a cup and trusting that you can use those small things to communicate powerful and incredible things, God, to transform what is impossible into something that is possible. Perhaps it's in the small things like the transformation of one tool of war into a gardening tool or a tool that's used for farming or a tool that's used for the construction of a home, God. Maybe it's just the transformation of one of those things that can speak to us about your love and grace. God, we know that your son, Jesus Christ, used the tools of gardening. He was the one who used plowshares and pruning hooks, not the tools of war to dismantle all the brokenness and destruction and darkness in this world. That when you raised him to new life, that was a clear sign, God, that he was using the tools of love and grace and life to destroy death itself. So God, as we gather around this meal, we ask that your spirit be present to us in that way, that we would know the powers of life and love and grace in this meal, and we would be able to trust again and anew in the power of life over death, in that resurrection hope that we have in Jesus Christ. As we gather at this table, we remember that there are so many others that are invited to this table beyond the space of this place right now. And so, God, we pray for the healing of the nations. We pray for the healing of the world. There is so much hurt. There is so much brokenness. There are so many tools of war being used throughout the earth for destructive ends. But, God, we hear the prophetic words of the Scripture, and we ask that we could see a day and a time, and even just in a small way, the transformation of death to life. Lord, may it be so. May there be healing amongst the nations. God, we pray for those in our own congregation who are hurting, who are in pain, friends or family members who are sick or who are not healthy. We pray for those in our midst who are struggling with mental health issues. God, may you heal us and you make, may you make us a more loving and gracious community to one another as we struggle and as we wrestle with those issues in our lives. Heal the sick in our midst. God, we also pray healing for broken families, not just for the brokenness within our families, but the brokenness that our families face on a daily basis, that we can't seem to just pause and rest for 24 hours, that our lives are hurried and busy, and we somehow don't just be able to take a break and notice where you are at work, God, to pause and to rest. So, Lord, will you heal the brokenness in our families and the brokenness that our families face? Who is like Yahweh? Who is like Yahweh? God, may that which seems impossible becomes possible through this sacrament of communion. May you pour out your spirit upon these elements of bread and cup, and may they be the communion for us this day of all the saints that have gathered throughout time, and may it be a forward-pointing sign of the sacred banquet communion that we will have in heaven as we sit with your Son, Jesus Christ. Bless this meal, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord of all and Savior of all, Jesus Christ, on the same night that he was betrayed and arrested, he took the bread from the table, the Passover feast, and after giving thanks for it, He broke it 
and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes again. At Trinity, we receive communion by way of intinction, which means that ushers will dismiss the rows of the pew starting in the back, moving to the forward. There'll be two stations at the front, people holding bread and people holding the cup. And you're invited to take a piece of the bread, dip it into the cup, and then eat it. And you can return to your seats after that. There's also prayer stations on both sides of the transepts. So if there's something going on in your life that you need prayer for, or even if it's not for you, but you feel a burden on your heart this day to be praying for the world, to be praying for someone, uh, you can go to those prayer stations and people would love to pray for you. Also, because we seek to be as inclusive of this meal as possible, we have bread which contains gluten and we also have gluten-free elements this day as well. And I'll be holding the gluten-free elements at my station over here. There's also a roving station, so if you're unable to come forward, just raise your hand, and the roving servers would be delighted to come and bring you the elements wherever you are seated. Friends, these are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Will the servers please come forward for this morning's communion?
Will you rise and body your spirit as we sing our final song this morning? No more war and no more fear. In the jubilee of God and Jesus Christ, spread the good news in word and in deed. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.